will first show you a very short film on the Right Livelihood Award, because Jacqueline Mudena is the laureate winner of the Li Right Livelihood Award. It's what we call the Alternative Nobel Prize, and it was founded by Jacob von Uxkuhl more than 30 years ago, I believe. And in fact, the Right Livelihood Award has nominated people like Wangari Matai, who became Nobel Prize, official Nobel Prize, much later. And so I would like to start the movie and then I will introduce Jacqueline. A lot of the nominees are uh, persons who in their own country um, would otherwise never get any sort of recognition for the kind of work that they're doing or even a spotlight or even many of their own citizens would not know that an organization or an individual like that has achieved so much. Laureates of the Right Livelihood Award often defy powerful corporate and political interests. Some of them face serious threats because of their work a few even live under the constant risk of losing their lives, freedom or health. One such example is Erwin Kreutler, award recipient in the year 2010. Erwin Kreutler ist ja Bischof in Lateinamerika und er unterstützt die Indianer, dass eben nicht ein riesiger Staudamm dort gebaut wird, der ihren Lebensraum kaputt machen würde. Und er wird deswegen natürlich auch befeindet und ähm, hat Polizeischutz, weil er eben selbst in Gefahr ist und er macht trotzdem diese Arbeit mit großem Engagement, großer persönlicher Überzeugung. The Right Livelihood Award supports its recipients and their projects. The prize opens doors and arouses public interest. For the laureates, this attention gives significant protection. Wir haben mehreren Leuten wirklich Leben retten können, dadurch, dass sie den Preis bekommen haben. Helen Mack Chang lives in Guatemala. In 1990, her sister Myrna was brutally murdered by the military. Despite the danger of her own life, Helen Mack Chang stood up to fight for justice and got the murderer of her sister convicted. She received the Right Livelihood Award in 1992. When she returned back to Guatemala City, the local head of the police said to her, now you are uh, untouchable because you have this international recognition. The Right Livelihood Award enjoys high public respect. Its reputation and credibility strengthen the laureates and their projects and bring them the attention that their important work deserves. Their governments and other powerful interest groups can no longer ignore or silence them. Someone who's very much criticized at home for the work that he or she is doing, when they then come to Stockholm to accept the award, they are, some of them, which I think, I think is fantastic, say, that, you know, I accept this award proudly on behalf of my country and the ambassador is invited and so that, you know, something positive for the country derives from that. And in, in some cases that has worked remarkably well. Biologist René Ngongo has campaigned for protection of the rainforests in the Democratic Republic of Congo. He has fought against destructive practices in the mining and forestry industry. As a result of his successful work, he received the Right Livelihood Award in the year 2009. When I called him to say that he would receive the award, he told me that the government had just threatened to close down his small organization. And 10 days later, when we made the announcement in the Swedish Foreign Office, it was all over the press in the Congo. And the same government that had threatened to close down his organization hosted a state reception for him. He was invited to a reception in the nicest hotel in Kinshasa with ministers speaking. So I think in those situations, the Right Livelihood Award really can galvanize, can give more energy, can give more oxygen to that person and that movement. So we really need an award like this for social transformation. So 
Rodrigo talks about how do we move from ideas to action. And obviously, when we talk about the common good, we need new role models. We, knew, we, we know we can be indigné, we can be, how do you say this in English, uh, shocked, but we also have to propose some solutions. We have to propose some answers. So we need new role models, we need new heroes. Here is one of these heroes, Jacqueline Mudina from Chad. Please, if you can come up to the stage. a human rights activist and then she will make a testimonial which will last around 15 minutes. Then we will have a break and please then come back at quarter past rather than 10 past 8 for the final part of the evening. Thank you Jacqueline. I give you the word. You will speak in English but so those who need the uh, earphones, you will speak in French, sorry. You need Merci. Thank you. It is for me a true pleasure and an honor to be here today and to be able to speak to you. Allow me to thank the chairman for inviting me to this summit. I must say that I've learned an awful lot today. I come from Chad. I'm a lawyer by profession. As I was saying, I come from Chad, Central Africa. And I'm a lawyer by profession. And I chair the Chad in Association for the Promotion and Protection of uh, Human Rights. It is an old association, but we're young at heart because we have a very ambitious program that covers the whole of Chad. This organization is headquartered in Jamena, the capital city, but we're also present through 10 sections throughout the country. We have various programs and activities. We work for women, with women, we work a lot for children and regarding women in one region of Chad. And there's a very sad phenomenon going on. In that region, women are considered a good, a property that you can inherit. When her husband dies, she's shared and transmitted just like the rest of uh, the husband's property. So we're trying to get rid of this practice in that region of Chad, though it is a custom that was meant to protect women in that region because women are not financially and economically independent. But other phenomenon come into play and interfere with this custom, which make it uh, unacceptable. We're also working on a phenomenon called the Bouvier phenomenon. And this is actually slavery. Children are sold by their parents between the age of 9 and 13. They're sold to cattle uh, breeders. They're sold into slavery and they're really abused, ill-treated, sometimes even killed by the cattle breeders. But when they're lucky enough to go back to their families, they totally beyond control because they've lost their sanity. So we uh, provide uh, legal, free legal counseling with the indigenous population as well. But our main activity for the past 10, 12 years has been the fight against impunity. This fight against impunity involves, I mean, is necessary because we consider that impunity is the main cause of human rights violations in our country. We also are dealing with a case of impunity, which has led, it, led us to insist on that activity, activity for eight years, from 1982 to 1990. Chad uh, experienced 
a very uh, dark uh, period under Mr. Isanabe. He's now in exile in Senegal, but these were very difficult years. Under Isanabe, he established a real repressive uh, uh, machinery that systematically operated throughout the country. When he left the country, an investigation was launched by the actual regime, and it turned out that 40,000 people had died and thousands of people had disappeared. My organization therefore decided to file a complaint against Mr. Nsnabre, who's in exile in Senegal. Following that complaint in Senegal, I went back to Chad, where I also filed a complaint against all his accomplices, all those that were involved in the repression. But it was really hard. That was back in 2000. In February, I I had 17 uh, plaintiffs with me. In child, in Chad, there's an organization of victims of this regime. I asked to be able to work with this organization, so we filed the first complaints in Senegal, then back in Chad. In October of 2000, the same year, I filed new complaints against 16 accomplices of Mr. Isanabre and I was able to name them, but this wasn't without consequences. I um, received lots of threats, but to me, there was just intimidations. I didn't take them seriously, really, really until on June 11, 2011, I organized a demonstration with uh, women of all uh, groups of society. We were supposed to challenge the uh, elections because it had been a real electoral uh, uh, farce. So I wrote a motion. And we were supposed to present this motion to the French ambassador who was responsible for sending it to France. But I was, at the time, uh, followed by the accomplices of Mr. Isnabre, and I was far from thinking that they could do anything. Every time I was threatened over the phone, every time I was told, you give up, otherwise you're dead. Your life is at stake here. And be sure that no one will talk about this case because you won't exist anymore. And I was taking these threats lightly, but on June 11, I was identified amongst these women demonstrating. The uh, police forces had actually the same um, agents as those that were operating under Isanabre, and so they threw a defensive grenade at me. My right leg was badly damaged. I was uh, taken care of for 15 months in France, and I just had my fourth surgery. So if you see me, I'm still uh, in pain, and I still have rem remains of grenades in my leg right now. So the thing is that the people against which I filed a complaint are precisely the people still in power today. If you go to the Ministry of the Interior, you'll find the same accomplices of Mr. Isenabre. If you go to the police, it's the same thing. Nothing has changed, but the investigation organized by the regime made several recommendations, amongst which getting rid of these people in the in uh, the government, getting rid of all these torturers, but nothing was done. So you can imagine what it means on a daily basis. We have to live with them. I'm a lawyer. I work in 
court, but when I enter the court, the guards, the security guard are Isenabra's cronies. So you can imagine these cronies supposed to protect you, and I'm fighting against him, and I'm coming across him every day when I go to work, so it's far from being easy. I once went to the police to renew my passport, and the policeman was looked at me and says, are you Jacqueline Mudaima? He says, yeah, right. Well, you're bothering policemen. Well, today it's my turn to bother you. I won't give you your passport. I had to wait for 48 hours, whereas it usually only takes a few hours. So I had to wait for 48 hours to get my passport. And then it's an old school friend who saw I was there and helped me get my passport. So that's, that's just one example. But I'm not welcomed in any other public offices. Since I'm still working on this case, I'm still the target of threats right now. Because amongst victims are today's tortures, and they're today's victims. The problem is that Isenabre used lots of people who are now in charge, starting with the current president of the republic. He was his head, head, of, um, head of his staff. And at now, from tortures, they've become victims. So it is very difficult for me uh, to deal with this case peacefully, because they wonder what will be their fate at the end of the case. So I take one step forward and then 10 steps backwards, because there's always someone to uh, come and stop me. The main problem is also African heads of states, because there's one trade union, what I call a trade union of, few, of a few African heads of states that do not want Mr. Isenabra to be judged, because this will uh, be, this will set a precedent, and many of them may go through the same process later on. So these heads of states are trying to stop me wherever I go, whatever I do. In Senegal, Abdullah Wad's regime got us to go round in circles for 12 years because at, what, at one point the African Union got involved in the case and wanted Senegal to judge Mr. Isanabre in the name of Africa. At one point, I was so fed up that we turned towards Belgium to file a new complaint. And the uh, Belgian judge that worked for five years on the case eventually indicted uh, Isenabre of crime against humanity, crime of genocide, and war crime. So Belgium has asked for its extradition to, from Senegal, but Senegal will not extradite Isenabre. President Wadi is just... Uh, making it an African case. The African Union is giving the case to Senegal to judge Mr. Isenabre. But since we know that this is just a farce for, for 10 years, we've been waiting without Mr. Isenabre being extradited or judged. Since I'm still working on the case with Belgium, Belgium just sent a fourth request for extradition to Senegal. and. The current regime, well, God knows if it's real political will to deal with this case or whether it's uh, still a farce, the current regime says there's no way we're going to send Isenabra in Belgium. He has to be judged in Senegal. It would be a pride for Africa. It would be uh, a way to strengthen Africa's dignity. But to me, there won't be any dignity in Africa so long as Africa will be uh, filled with torturers. While Africa is still slaughtering its sons and daughters, it will have no dignity. I, for one, believe that the dignity of Africa is to use this case 
to have the courage to ask Senegal to simply extradite Issan Abre to Belgium so he can be judged there. And then we'll draw uh, the lessons. This will be the real lesson for Africa. And then Africa will be able to use it and uh, maybe create a court to judge its culprits without having to send them abroad and have them judged by uh, the little white men, as African Union was saying. So I've tried to simplify so as not to delay you any further. So thank you for your attention.